for your engagement, your education, and uh, again your, your interesting comments. Now we are going to a different panel, which is entitled European Discourse in National and Community Spaces. And unfortunately, both Carmel and Pope have joined us, uh, so, but I'm sure she will she answer your question. We have some remarks, and you have a chance to read her paper. Uh, we can pass you your questions and comments to her. So, uh, now I want to announce as well. We're running a bit out of time, so we'll have no presentations and afterward we'll go for lunch. So we'll have also the, the discussion, my remarks after, after lunch. We'll do the same as in the last one. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Peter Hitler from the University of Graz, who will be presenting on the Austrian's view on European integration, the history of our relationship from 1945 to 1995. Thank you very much for the introduction. The matter of all these history of the relationship between Austria and European integration became short shortly after World War II and has lasted until today. It only reached its preliminary climax in Austria's entry into the European Union in 1995. This relationship has had its up and down. One could write the speed of an unbelievable that has been unfolding between Austria and the Europe of integration since World War II. Most of the papers dealing with this topic have only confined in the association process between Austria and the European integration by general process on the accession to the European Union in 1995. Here, however, I intend to run it on a path in order to show this relationship through the eyes of the artists. The crucial question that ought to be answered is how can culture and history of the relationship between Austria and the European integration from 
of the relationship between Austria and the European integration? This question is easily answered. During the 15 years between 1945 and 1995, Austrian national identity was constructed and formed too. Then looking back, we are therefore dealing with two classic episodic narratives that on the love each other and are the assembled in parallel. Both of these narratives do not only run parallel to each other, they depend on each other in their construction. At least the history of Austrian national identity would be unsuitable without the history of European integration surrounding it. It seems to form the historical outside to which Austrian national identity was already set consciously at its very beginning. However, this does not mean that Austrian national identity was only constructed in opposition to European history of integration. Rather, it involved and evolved complex discursive interaction and circulation processes in which the foundation for the Austrian is the European and the European is the Austrian Muslim. So what does that mean for those who aim to present the history of the relationship between Austria and the European integration in a cultural and scientific way? It means that Austrian national identity is a European phenomenon. This may not be a new insight, but the methods of this is to be implemented in historiography is indeed new. As Austrian national identity represents a European phenomenon, a culture of history of the relationship between Austria and the European itself from the national parity and the Europeanize itself. It is necessary to change perspective, away from the well-practiced Austrian perspective, from the inside towards a European global perspective. This change of perspective, one can speak of the paradigmatic term, and brings the difficulties that I made in researching Austrian national identity history or a cultural or history of the year and the last relationship. The difficulties are to break through the boundaries constituting Austrian national identity while taking this bearing at the third. Among other things, the attempt to distance itself from the rest of Europe is an important feature of Austria's national identity. One only has to think of the separation of Germany before the continent's east. By taking the bearing at the third, those discursive boundaries have to be broken. If one writes about the cultural history concerning the Arbufu between Austria and the European integration, one has to adopt the European perspective, and this is dangerous in the Austrian national identity because its collectively and discursively effective fundament consists in the separation from the rest of Europe, and by undermining this fundament, Austrian identity itself becomes incoherent, and therefore its discursive existence is at risk. This means that the writing of a culture of the story of the relationship between Austria and the European integration equals a dangerous experiment as one of the columns of Austrian national identity is removed and at the same time replaced by a new column that rests on Austria's national identity's European spotlight. It is the first task of the culture of the history the relationship between Austria and the European integration to perform this experiment. To re evaluate Austria's identity and national history. One comes from an isolated national identity to a European partial phenomenon that appears to be much less similar and worse of the other identification. This event, the deconstruction of Austrian national identity, is the first partial result of a cultural history dealing with the relationship between Austria and the Constitution of the the second problem area arising for a cultural history of the relationship between Austria and the European integration concerns the issue of continuity of Austria's national history. This is again important when dealing with the country's identity. However, because of the existential dispersive importance of the historical theoretical category of continuity, it deserves to be looked at them closely. The continuity of Austrian national history results from many factors, such as the existing landscape of political parties, the social partnership, neutrality, the so-called civic of Marischwasse, etc. Whatever dimensions of the continuity are considered, this is all about some fundamental views that are therefore among the legendary founding myth of the Second Republic. Those founding myths are legendary for their representative social. Constructive view that 
does not only play a role for the creation of Austrian society, but in which the Austrian history becomes visible. The Austrian history is a continuous narrative. The storyline involves the around the 1990s, 1945, which is the year of the end of the Second World War and Austria's restoration, the year of 1955, which is the year of the Austrian state treaty, and the year of 1995, which is the year of Austria's accession to the European Union. Those 19 years represent the last in the straight line of Austrian historical continuity. Only by means of those years it is possible to realize the consensus of the country's history and to include it into a master narrative of the history of Austria. Thus, those 19 years have been constituted in an existential meaning for the Austrian story. They constitute the continuity of the Austrian. If one takes a look at the history of the relationship between Austria and the European integration now, a second problem area can be detected. The fundamental years 1945, 1955, and 1995 do not seem to be as quite important milestones as the historical process anymore. And that is not all. In this context, other eventful years, such as 1959, 1960, which is the year of the foundation, the European Free Trade Association is Austria as a founding member, the year of 1972, which is the year of the Free Trade Agreement between the rest of the European Free Trade Association and the European Community, or the year of 1989, which, 1989, which is the year of the Austrian Land of Brussels, seems to be of much greater importance in the European years of Austrian national history. Thus, Western national history is based is a competitive narrative that does not do anything less than an existential question the continuity of the Austrian master narrative. The form of continuity that can be deducted from the Austrian European in the years of 1959, 1960, 1972, and 1989 is, as far as its descriptive features are concerned, substantially more elastic than the seeming continuity construction of Austrian national history. Hence, the Austrian national narrative merges into variants in small historic particulars, and the Austrian ostensible fixed historical constancy of national history becomes an unstructured conglomerate of historical events. These qualities of the competitive narrative, in its consequence, one can also speak of an historic reputation, constitute the second problem area of the cultural history of the relation. Between Austria and the European integration. What are the consequences of the history of the historic reputation? The history of the Austrian nation appears as a development of many historic events and years. It's unstructured and needs to be resolved. And exactly here it lies the chance for a culture of the story of the relationship between Austria and the European integration. The necessity to rethink continuity represents an opportunity to update the Austrian by European bicycle. If one writes a culture of history in the relationship between Austria and European integration, this is the second consequence. The destruction of Austrian national continuity is a restart in terms of the European shadows of Okay, that's okay.
uh, a look at uh, black African uh, deputies uh, because the, um, the sort of uh, pretty much the same uh, official records and then I'll hopefully expand it to different sources um, in the future. So what, what I'd like to do um, for my friend in the paper is to bring together uh, from start uh, two different sets of historiographies, one on French imperialism and the other on European integration. Um, so at the same time as we have the reconstruction of uh, the European nation state and the, um, a new form of cooperation, uh, institutional cooperation that's set up in the European uh, community, you also have renegotiation uh, within uh, the French Empire, which is the French Union in 1946. It's obviously very symbolic, but it also comes with a new institutional structure and a new uh, framework of which France is presenting itself to, actually to itself, to its colonies and to the world. Um, in this period. So, um, the central question, uh, or one of, the, one of the central questions that was facing uh, the French Assembly was, is the French Union compatible with the European Union? Uh, all the deputies, to some extent, uh, are addressing this question, but clearly for the uh, Black African uh, deputies, this is a central concern. Um, there's also Algerian deputies up until uh, 1955, until the elections are canceled uh, because of the spiral of violence that occurs there. So one of the things that I think that hopefully in the end, if I, if I pursue this, I think that I can try to um, contribute to is the discussion of why the outcome in French West Africa is different uh, than that of, um, of uh, Algeria and in China, right, which has a violent uh, war is the outcome of their independence rather than the negotiated settlement that occurs from the period um, 1958 to 1961 in, in French West Africa, uh, with the exception of, uh, of uh, Guinea. Okay. Um, so, one of the key things, this is a very unique set of deputies, right? Um, usually around 30 uh, from the French West Africa, also in, in my mind, so I Madagascar, uh, in, in this, uh, but I'm going to focus more on uh, French West Africa. Um, they come from diverse backgrounds, uh, but these are the Baudouin, these are, um, which is French for evolve. This is kind of the, the word there, uh, right, which has a clear um, implication for probably not too comfortable with. Uh, these are people who um, were a minority in their communities, and that they, they grew up in French schools, uh, French language schools, um, and this is only a small proportion at this time of uh, people who were educated um, in French West Africa. And, in addition, um, most of them wind up living in Paris, at least for a time, right, as their deputies, but a number of them stay in Paris after the independence period. Some of them become leaders of the independent, uh, the independent states, uh, such as uh, Senghor in the Seneca, uh, Agathe, I'm not exactly sure if you pronounce it, sorry, in, uh, in uh, uh, Adapone, which becomes Benin, um, and Rukwe uh, in the in the Ivory Coast. Um, one of the things that is often discussed in terms of the above way, but also I can see very clearly in the case of uh, Sangerism, the people who come out of the Naked Judah movements of the end of war period, uh, is that there is an idea that French imperialism is different uh, than, for instance, British imperialism. Um, part of this is within the institutional structure that's set up in the French Union. Uh, the fact that you have black Africans uh, in the uh, assembly representing black African constituencies uh, differentiates uh, the whole thing from, for instance, Britain, right, where you have, um, uh, you don't have Kenyan MPs, right, in the uh, House of Commons. Okay, I'll just probably move a bit quicker. Um, so, one of the things I noticed is black African deputies, and this would be something I'd have to look at more seriously, are, are using language. Um, of the French Republican tradition in order to push um, uh, programs that are would be beneficial for their communities. Uh, but I don't see this as necessarily a uh, cynical on that part. I think that this probably, uh, this is related to literature, represents um, a belief in right, the, the uh, tradition of uh, liberty and equality, uh, precarity of the, of the French Republic. Okay, so. Um, the central conclusion I come to isn't actually a conclusion at all, is to look at um, the uh, uh, statements, the floor statements uh, to the assembly, and it's filled with um, 
If you read them, it seems like they should vote against the project. They put forward what seemed to be pretty persuasive reasons, reasons to vote against European integration measures in the 1950s, and then they vote for it um, overwhelmingly. Uh, so this is kind of a paradox, um, not necessarily a paradox. I mean, we can vote for something even though we have objections to it. Uh, but it posed at that moment existential questions about the relationship between France, Africa, uh, and Europe um, to, to the mind, which is extremely important. It was really a, term, uh, a period of turmoil within the French Republic uh, by the late 1950s, and certainly within the French Union or French Empire. Right? Okay. Uh, and to be clear, right, these are Boutonnerian uh, um, markets I'm talking about, not the capitalists in Asia or, or some of these others. Okay. So, um, one of the things they often do is remind the assembly uh, that they are as equal Frenchmen uh, to everybody else and remind them of the periods of sacrifice. This is often in the context of um, a series of European uh, uh, negotiations that do not explicitly, uh, more so in the European economic community of the Gates of Jesus Paris, uh, but less so before, take um, Nobody asks really black Africans in the deputies what they think of the European um, negotiations. This isn't the uh, first concern, right? So one of the fears that develops is that um, the uh, gains that have been uh, made by uh, black, the black African, especially West African uh, areas that are to citizenship and also economic assistance will be threatened uh, by the, uh, the European community. Uh, and there's an idea that they're, they're concerned to being ignored, right? Okay. You also see, well, actually, I'm going to skip that. There's a neutralist sentiment in the black African dead but I... Uh, so it's Oh, okay. Well, actually, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think that this, this is one of the, the, the key ideas, that they're playing to um, the... the view of the French entities themselves, often that France should um, uh, assert itself on the world stage, right? But the views are present presenting this foreshadows uh, the policies, uh, or the, the expressed policies of the newly independent states after uh, this period, um, that uh, there needs to be a neutral block, right, between uh, the capitalist West and the communist East, and that the French Union could play this role. Uh, and it's not clear that Europe would. Uh, to a large extent, this type of step, uh, despite right, our view of the goal and all this, this goes into uh, the um, series of negotiations that leads to NATO, uh, which is the military counterpart that has to uh, mark a plan and all this. Uh, Atlanticism is pretty strong uh, within the French political elites who are running the show um, in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, and then you have Uh, and it's not in the treaties of Rome. Uh, 
so, um, and this is for various reasons, but these are the supernatural, and despite that, they, they, they both these, uh, these trees. Okay. And I don't have a kind of explanation for that. Uh, one of the other things that sort of consistently this plays into actually the nice thing that you showed us about Germany uh, is mistrust of the other European states. And this goes along with the idea that uh, uh, there's something special about French imperialism. I should talk about real quickly um, about that. It says, uh, this is in the European defense community base. Uh, the French of Europe have not always had an irreproachable attitude towards the Ushmaic populations, but it is necessary to recognize and proclaim that in all the Western nations, France has manifested the least racial discrimination. They received the applause of this. Uh, and also, after this is, you know, yeah. Uh, and also, after several centuries of Ushmaic presence, she is a nation that is best learned in the human and political rules of conduct, and displaying these decent people, best of all peoples. Uh, but this is um, somebody from the, uh, uh, from the French of Africa saying this. The natural and traditional generosity of the French of Europe make them the best possible associates with Jewish American peoples. Um, but you have it here in, if you look at the six states, right, these are the colonial powers besides Luxembourg, right? Uh, and it's brought up. Um, uh, it, it becomes a chance to replay the last 50 or 100 years of imperialism, uh, the Belgian Congo, right? Uh, this is brought up numerous times in the debates. Um, Italian actions as well, but that gets into immigration, which we'll talk about in a second. And the other thing is, is Germany, one deputy, he's from, uh, uh, from Togo, uh, base, oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, he brings up that um, when Togo was under German uh, administration, uh, Uh, immigration. Uh, today, right, the, the debate um, and the context of immigration is from Africa towards uh, Europe, right? Uh, but in this period, you still had um, the mindset of uh, European you know, populated, uh, especially uh, Germany being you know, populated, right? Britain, around all that. Uh, the idea that it's going to, if, if you have free movement of labor, right, which is one of the um, uh, things being pushed within the European immigration um, measures. Uh, you're going to have a flood of what they call petite blanc, uh, small whites kind of, uh, uh, meaning not rich whites, towards the colonies, uh, but not colonies, towards the territories. Uh, and this is going to um, uh, perhaps, uh, Sanger says that these, these type of people secrete uh, racism uh, like sweat. There's, there's, there's a quote like that. Um, and you have South Africa, I mentioned South Africa explicitly as a model that should, should not be uh, followed. Uh, and also, um, I, don't, I don't have too much about uh, um, German or Italian ideas of you know, whether European integration would uh, allow them to uh, immigrate, right? would, would, or emigrate, uh, promote immigration. Uh, but I did see in the archive actually last week, which is convenient for this, a pro uh, during the East, that the uh, European Cold Steel community debates a uh, propaganda piece, um, uh, actually a political cartoon, showing Germans going to so that this would be a way uh, uh, in order to, yeah, you, you get the point. Um, the other thing is development assistance. One of the parts of the sort of new deal in the renegotiation period, uh, process was that France was, was uh, promising to its territories uh, that it would work to industrialize uh, the territories and to raise the living standards over a long period to European levels. Um, and this cost a lot of money. Uh, and eventually you can see that they are, they are pumping in a lot of money into these, uh, um, into these territories. So what does Europe mean for the development assistance program? And this is, this is probably the, the thing that's brought up the most um, in, in the debates. I'm going to run through it real quickly. Um, as you're envisioning from the Messina conference, right, in 1955, an internal market, uh, what does this mean? For, there already is an internal market. Uh, France has an internal market with its territories, right? Uh, it's a particular type of internal market uh, with high tariffs, uh, right? This is what leads to a lot of the substance of the uh, negotiations for the treaties of Rome uh, with Germany and Italy, uh, or Germany specifically that wants to lower tariffs. Um, the trade off.
generally was that uh, the territories uh, would sell um, raw materials or uh, produce uh, for uh, high costs in France, so the, the costs of the products were higher in France than were in the rest of the, um, for most of the rest of Europe. Uh, I don't know about the eastern part of Europe. Uh, and um, uh, in turn, France would get artificially high prices for its industrial goods within West African territories. So, uh, what happens if you have a third unit term? What does this mean? It's not clear what this means uh, during, during the debates. The, the principal fears that are expressed, and I, I just read on this real quickly, uh, is that if you have, comp if, you have um, if you lower the tariffs and you have free competition, uh, this will crush uh, West African industry in dense ones. Uh, there's no chance you can build it, but this goes back to uh, the case within Europe in the 19th century. And, uh, and other countries that were in the process of industrialization. Uh, the other thing is low tariffs might mean a collapse in, uh, in uh, export prices right? uh, from the West African territories, which will would potentially um, end the rise of standards of living. And living standards were, yes, uh, I'll be uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, living standards were rising actually pretty substantially in terms of, terms of that West Africa during this period. Uh, and lastly, um, what, it, it wasn't clear at all what West Africa's place would be within the, within the European community. Um, what would become the development funds, particularly, uh, that were established in 1946. Um, so we have a quote, we must be either in or outside the Republic, and I think that sums up uh, the idea pretty well. So, we have all these reasons um, for them to oppose, uh, and yet, um, I, don't, I don't have all the vote counts. I did a vote analysis, which, is, which you can see in the papers, so I won't go through the details, but it includes the Council of Europe, uh, the 1949 vote, uh, the European Colonial Steel Community vote in uh, December 1951, uh, and a preliminary vote on Europe, uh, so 1956, before uh, the Treaty of Rome in 1957. And in every case, um, the West African deputies uh, proportionally both substantially higher than um, the white deputies uh, for these, uh, for, than the entire rest of the uh, community, because some of these votes were, were somewhat close. Uh, however, it does seem that they voted against the EDS, the, the European uh, Defense Community, uh, but I don't have any uh, vote totals for that. Uh, so I have this, um, I don't want to call it, a, I think, call it a paradox, I think, before, but, uh, Contradictory sets of, sets of sources uh, that I think this is a complicated story. Um, it involves identity. This is my concluding remark. Uh, I think it involves issues of identity. Um, people who are on the, the, the forefront of the relations between France and West Africa and, um, uh, and France and Europe. So this will contribute to uh, the decolonization process itself and the new form of development assistance uh, that develops under uh, Euro uh, the European uh, Commission uh, and is solidified in the, I don't know, it's, it's Yuande, I think, uh, before Lomé. Um, Yuande? Okay. Uh, from 1963. Uh, um, yeah, so I'll stop there.